Hello and welcome to this video on key developments in competition law for spring 2017. My name is Bruce Kilpatrick, I'm a partner at Adelshaw Goddard based in London and I head up our competition team nationwide. I'm going to be talking today about key developments that we've seen recently in CMA enforcement activity and I'm going to be comparing what we've seen from the CMA both in terms of their focus on industry sectors but also in terms of their focus on the subject matter of their investigations to what we saw previously from the OFT. I'm going to be also comparing in the online sector what we've seen from the CMA uh, compared to what we've seen from the European Commission in their e-commerce inquiry. And then I'm going to close with a few words on the changes that we've seen in the Competition Appeal Tribunal, or the CAT, particularly the introduction of the fast track mechanism and what we might expect to see in 2017. One of the criticisms that was levelled at the OFT by the National Audit Office back in 2010 was that it was taking too long for it to, to take cases through from the beginning to end, uh, and also that it wasn't taking enough of those cases. So that, at the time, the 2010 report followed uh, two quite high-profile cases that had collapsed for the OFT. The first was the tobacco uh, investigation, and the second was a criminal investigation into British Airways. Uh, which followed on from uh, price fixing between BA and Virgin on air fuel passenger surcharges. Uh, so actually what's happened since then is that a lot of the work, a lot of the improvement uh, work was, or was carried out by the OFT before the end of 2014. So there were huge improvements to the checks and balances in place amongst the, the CMA case teams. And also, there was already some improvement in terms of the speed at which decisions were, were being taken. Uh, there was also a change to, uh, to a case decision group that was separate from the case team that was responsible for actually taking the case through to the, to the final decision stage. And effectively, what's happened is, since April 2014, when the CMA came into, uh, into effect, they've taken a lot of those improvements that were already in train, and they've taken a number of steps to, to build on that. So one of the things that they've done is pick up significantly the number of cases that they open each year. Uh, the NAO effectively uh, criticised the, the, the CMA as early as February of this year, saying that uh, actually we, they were looking at about five cases being brought uh, or at least being opened every year. But what we've seen since November 2015 is actually 16 cases being opened, which is a very significant um, uptick in work. Uh, we've also seen improvements in terms of the speed at which decisions are taken by the CMA. So one of the cases that they've concluded this year actually took them eight months from beginning to end, which was the online posters case, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, but at the same time, there are still some delays, and the more complex cases do take time to, to bring from beginning to end. So in the pharmaceutical case, uh, which was brought against for paroxetine uh, against GSK and a number of generic drug manufacturers, that took four and a half years from beginning to end. So there are improvements in, in, in train uh, from the CMA and I think that um, they really have taken the NAO criticism seriously and responded to that in the way that they've, they now, they prosecute their cases. The key themes emerging from the CMA's enforcement priorities and how those approach to the, to the OFT's work are are both related to the subject matter of their investigations and also related to uh, the process, so if you like, the, the rigour and um, the speed at which they, they, they uh, take cases. So on the subject matter side, uh, the CMA is focused in a number of areas on uh, resale price maintenance type cases. So those are cases where suppliers have either restricted uh, the ability or actually um, prevented their distributors from selling below a specified price or set um, a limit on the amount below list price, for example, that they can resell their products at. So we've seen two cases this year, uh, 2016, or last year rather, uh, that are resale price maintenance related. One is, was in the bathroom fittings industry and another was in the commercial catering, so kitchen catering equipment. Both of those cases involve suppliers either uh, setting some kind of price floor below which their distributors could not resell the products online, or in the case of commercial catering, 
uh, effectively set an, a minimum advertised pricing policy for products that, are, that were sold online through distributors' websites. Both of those cases were prioritised by the CMA. They didn't decide to take a case uh, against a huge group of, of distributors. They prioritised that investigation and focused in the bathroom fittings case on one particular distributor, um, which had a pricing policy in place. And there was evidence that that pricing policy was both monitored and then adhered to. Um, and it, what's interesting is that the CMA has focused on resale price maintenance uh, cases because it feels that those cases do lead to direct harm at the consumer level. Um, another uh, area of focus for the CMA has been in relation to online markets. So we've seen a number of cases where uh, the CMA has looked at either total uh, bans of, of goods sold online, so Ping golf clubs, the CMA took a case against Ping for preventing its distributors from selling at all its products online. Um, and we've also seen quite an interesting case uh, for the resale of, of uh, posters uh, on Amazon Marketplace between two online sellers, uh, which used actually a pricing algorithm to decide uh, the price at which they resell those products, which had the effect of effectively colluding on the resale price, but through a computer-driven algorithm. And that's one of the first cases that we've seen that, um, that focuses on quite a new and novel area of, of uh, competition law. The CMA doesn't have so many new powers and it's in, in competition enforcement toolkit. It's largely inherited those powers from the OFT. Um, there were some changes brought in by the act that brought the CMA into force, the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Act in 2014 but they were largely technical changes which gave the CMA some new powers on dawn raids to ask questions of individuals. But apart from that, actually the CMA's toolkit remains largely as it was. I think what's changed is that the CMA has shown a willingness to use some of those enforcement powers in ways in which the OFT didn't previously use them. So to give you some examples of that, uh, the CMA uh, has imposed a penalty in uh, a recent uh, investigation which related to Pfizer and Flynn Pharmaceutical for excessive pricing of a particular anti-epilepsy drug. And that was the first time that they actually imposed a penalty for failure to reply to a, a formal written information request. So it was a small penalty, only 10,000 pounds to Pfizer, but nevertheless it got the attention of the of competitional practitioners in particular because it was the first time they'd used those, those powers to, to fine a company for failure to, to respond accurately to an information request. Another example of the, the, the new powers that the CMA has used relates to director disqualification. So in the case that I mentioned just a moment ago about for the sale of, online, of posters online through Amazon Marketplace, actually that was a case that originated in the US. But when the CMA brought its investigation using its civil enforcement powers, they also disqualified a director of one of the companies, Trod Limited, a man called Daniel Aston. And that was the first time that actually the CMA had used its director disqualification powers, uh, which had been in place for, um, since the Enterprise Act came into force back in 2003. So it was a long time in the making. And I think deliberately the CMA used those uh, new powers to send a message to, to companies that there were serious implications for breaching competition law. And then a third uh, use, of, use of powers would be in relation to the criminal cartel offence. So again, the law there has, has, has changed. There's no longer a requirement to show uh, dishonesty. Uh, but actually, if we look back to the law before 2014 and before the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Act came into force, the CMA looked at the cases that it, it, that it had inherited from the OFT in the criminal cartel sphere and decided that of the three cases that were on the slate that it would drop two and focus on the third one. Uh, the third one being um, a case in relation to uh, precast concrete drainage uh, products. But it also uh, closed a case that related to galvanised steel tanks where it has both a civil investigation, but it also brought a criminal case before Southwark Crown Court. Uh, now that case ultimately didn't um, 
end up in a successful prosecution for the CMA. But they have moved forward with the precast concrete drainage pipes case, and they have secured a guilty plea at Southwark Crown Court in that case, which again is a significant, um, you know, significant high point really for the, for the CMA in, 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 in um, its criminal enforcement powers. The sectors that the CMA is focusing its most attention on are in some ways quite similar, again, to the, the areas that the OFT focused on. So over the last 12 months, we've seen two very high profile cases that CMA has brought in the pharmaceutical sector. And we've also seen, again, a lot of enforcement action in relation to, to online sales. So in the pharmaceutical sector, those two cases uh, resulted in penalties of more than £130 million pounds between them. The most recent one was between Pfizer and Flynn Pharmaceutical for the sale of uh, sodium phenytoid, uh, a, an anti-epilepsy drug. And the CMA, it's the first time in a long time that the CMA has taken a case uh, relating to abuse of dominance and in particular for excessive pricing in relation to the distribution of that drug. And that resulted in a decision and a penalty of £90 million uh, very recently towards the end of 2016 uh, imposed against Flynn and Pfizer uh, for, um, for breach of competition law. Now, that case is currently on appeal before the Competition Appeal Tribunal, but it shows that the CMA, again, is focusing on the pharmaceutical market and particularly the public healthcare sector, uh, given you know, its view uh, set out in the press release that these uh, excessive pricing charges ultimately harm the interests of consumers and result in, in higher prices than would otherwise have, have um, existed in the, in the health service. The other case that the CMA took in the pharmaceutical sector related to um, a case relating to the supply of paroxetin, um, which was uh, a case that involved GSK as the originator, the patent holder of the drug, and also generic uh, uh, drug manufacturers. And that related to uh, you know, an alleged um, pay for delay or um, type case, so a patent settlement case, which the CMA argues was anti-competitive because it harmed consumers by keeping generic drug manufacturers off the market for longer than should have been the case under a patent settlement agreement. Again, that case is complex. It's under appeal, and it resulted in a, in a penalty of uh, close to £45 million. Pounds. So you can see that those cases which focus on the pharmaceutical sector and those cases which result in very significant penalties are cases which um, you know, the CMA will, uh, will, will face some, some scrutiny before the Competition Appeal Tribunal and are the first real challenges for the CMA in deciding whether their new system of checks and balances has bedded down. Many of the cases that it brought in 2016 were not such significant penalties. They were smaller cases, bathroom fittings, commercial catering, the modelling sector, where those companies, many of those companies chose to settle. And so we won't see the same issues being, being um, looked at uh, on appeal. Uh, one of the other uh, sectors uh, that the, not so much the CMA has looked at, but the sectoral regulators have looked at is financial services. The FCA has significantly built its its own competition team, and it, it, is, it now has concurrent powers to enforce competition or in the financial services sector. So certainly our clients are watching what the FCA is doing very closely on the competition enforcement side. They have cases running in, in, the, in relation to competition law enforcement. And of course, some of the cases that the European Commission has taken in recent years, such as LIBOR, were cases that essentially related to the financial services sector in the UK. Um, and the FCA is looking at uh, not just whether markets can work more effectively in the financial services sector, but whether there are potentially anti-competitive arrangements in that sector which need to be looked at. The CMA is certainly prioritising online markets and to some extent it is influenced by uh, the European Commission's activities. So the European Commission has had a, an e-commerce sector inquiry that it's been running now for, uh, for around two years, looking at effectively doing a stock take of the, of the e-commerce sector across, uh, across the member states of the EU, looking at barriers for retailers to, uh, to sell,
uh, goods, uh, whether there are contractual restrictions between suppliers and retailers that prevent them from selling or restrict their ability to sell across border, and also for customers in selecting and sourcing goods across border. Um, the CMA has been focused on uh, object or by, by object or the more serious competition or infringements which relate to online sales. So as I mentioned earlier, the CMA has taken cases relating to uh, absolute online sales ban. So the Ping Golf Club case was, a, was an example of that, an absolute ban on distributors selling Ping Golf products and, and equipment online. But they've also taken cases involving minimum internet advertised pricing, so a restriction on the ability for distributors and resellers to, uh, to advertise prices below a certain level online and also similar cases where um, there's been a, a, an extent or a floor, the, uh, a limit on the ability for distributors to, uh, to sell products for less than a specified percentage of the list price for example. So the CMA's focus has been on those areas predominantly. Um, it's also taken um, an interesting case relating to pricing algorithms as I mentioned earlier and that's certainly I think um, where the pricing algorithm uh, results not just in, in the price uh, being matched and therefore reduced, taking account of the most competitive price online, but where the pricing algorithm also results in prices increasing automatically and where the companies have set that pricing algorithm in a way which removes the risks of competition. So they know that if their rival reduces a the price, they follow it down, and if the price increases, they follow it up and they know who is being monitored, those sorts of cases are certainly in the line of sight of the CMA. In relation to the less serious forms of online sales activity, actually the CMA has not, for example, looked at some of the issues that the European Commission has been looking at in the context of its e-commerce inquiry. So, for example, geo-blocking type restrictions in contracts between suppliers and retailers have been a real focus for the European Commission in their e-commerce inquiry. Um, but actually the CMA has not really looked at geo-blocking restrictions in the same way. Uh, similarly, the European Commission has been looking at uh, what are called platform bans or platform restrictions whereby suppliers place restrictions on the ability for their goods to be resold on particular platforms such as eBay or Amazon Marketplace. Uh, the European Commission uh, in its e-commerce inquiry has not said that those amount to hardcore or the most serious forms of anti-competitive restriction but actually there is a case that we're expecting from the European Court of Justice uh, which is looking at the issue of online platform restrictions and which I think will drive potentially some follow-up uh, if not enforcement activity then guidance from the European Commission on what practices are acceptable and and relate to the products that are ultimately being sold and what products are effectively overly restrictive. So in terms of follow-up enforcement activity from the European Commission's e-commerce inquiry, uh, it's not clear yet exactly what that will be. We would expect to see some cases which look at potentially high-profile suppliers and retailers so branded goods suppliers in particular, um, and also online suppliers, so um, uh, where there are contractual restrictions in place between the supplier and the reseller or the platform that, that distributes those, those goods. So um, certainly we would expect to see where there are some cases that, that include, for example, geo-blocking type restrictions or restrictions on the ability of the retailer in that contract to resell to customers across border. Those are the sorts of issues that we would expect the European Commission to, to follow up and to take enforcement activity. Now, there's a issue here in relation to ge geo-blocking where, of course, you know, retailers can take their own independent, independent decision as to which customers they want to sell to. If there's no contractual restriction or if there's no indirect restriction in the supplier-retailer relationship, then retailers are free to decide whether they want to sell across border or not. That's not something to which the competition law apl laws apply because there's no underlying agreement, anti-competitive agreement between the supplier and the retailer. So this is a slightly more complex area and the European Commission is looking at 
whether actually there are other actions that it can take as part of the digital single market to look at geo-blocking, potentially by taking regulatory action to improve the flow of goods and services across border. One of the changes that was brought in when the CMA came into force was the removal of the requirement for the criminal cartel offence to show dishonesty on, on the part of individuals. So before 2014, or at least for cases that originated before 2014, there was a dishonesty requirement. And if you'll be aware that the CMA and, and the OFT previously, when bringing criminal cartel cases, had a somewhat checkered history because of that dishonesty requirement. The first uh, prosecution which was ultimately dropped and did not result in, in a guilty plea was the British Airways Virgin price fixing case where the OFT actually came in for some criticism as to the way in which they, they handled that case and they've, they and the CMA have learned a, a lot of lessons about criminal enforcement activity particularly when a civil case is running in parallel. So since then the CMA has uh, in relation to its criminal cases, taken action to focus in on, for pre-2014 activity, uh, on one case in particular, the, uh, the precast concrete drainage products case. And they've decided to move forward with that case, notwithstanding the fact that the, the dishonesty requirement still remains. For cases after 2014, of course, there is no requirement to show dishonesty and it's expected that the CMA, therefore, in putting its case before a jury for them to take a decision on whether to, to find a guilty plea or to acquit, will find it uh, somewhat more straightforward to explain to the jury why those hardcore cartel cases result in consumer harm and are, um, are worthy of a criminal prosecution. So, Certainly the CMA is, is helped by the way in which the new criminal cartel offence is formulated. There are defences to that criminal cartel offence. So for example, if individuals take independent legal advice on whether the arrangements under consideration were anti-competitive or not, then that would be a defence to, uh, to a charge that their conduct in a particular case was criminal. So. I think that what we see here is some relatively complex exclusions and defences to the criminal cartel offence under the new regime, but also some relatively pragmatic approaches to, uh, to companies which are considering perhaps arrangements that are not plain vanilla if they encourage their employees and directors to take independent legal advice. Then although the subject matter may still be anti-competitive, those individuals and directors will not end up at risk of prosecution for the criminal cartel offence. There have been a number of important changes to the Competition Appeal Tribunal since the CMA assumed power in April 2014. Most recently we've had the Consumer Rights Act uh, 2015 which was passed last year which resulted in the introduction of a new collective redress mechanism. So previously if a collective claim was being brought off the back of anti-competitive activity, that had to be brought in on an opt-in basis, so consumers had to actively opt in to a collective uh, redress. Now we have an opt-out mechanism available, so we've seen two cases, or we are seeing two cases, move through the Competition Appeal Tribunal, the CAT, looking at securing effective redress on behalf of consumers. The first of those was a case brought by uh, Age Concern uh, following on from the CMA's infringement decision relating to mobility scooters. And the second is a very high profile, the, the most uh, high value competition claim brought before the English courts in the MasterCard interchange case, which relates to uh, a claim of around £14 billion pounds on behalf of consumers at large. Both of those cases are obviously going to be watched very closely by companies and up the ante for those companies that are uh, either found or accused of, of anti-competitive activity. One of the other things that we've seen as well uh, relates to a, a raft of measures that have been introduced in the Consumer Rights Act to improve the ability for customers to bring competition claims before the CAT through a fast-track mechanism. That's particularly well suited for small and medium-sized companies where the competition authorities may not have taken enforcement action but where the claims are either uh, an injunction based on a competition or ground or seeking 
damages for anti-competitive conduct where the authorities have not taken a particular case and opened an investigation. One of the attractions of that case is uh, an expedited timeline for those cases to be heard, but also some quite innovative approaches to cost capping for legal fees, and uh, which helps to de-risk that process financially for potential claimants. That's an area where we've seen quite a lot of activity in 2016, and we would expect to see more in 2017. Certainly our clients are seeing more cases which are uh, threatening action before the Competition Appeal Tribunal, and we're watching that, that space closely. When deciding whether to settle a case with the CMA, there are some advantages potentially for companies, but there are also some points, potential disadvantages for that, that process to, to, to think about. First of all, in terms of the advantages, in many cases there are significant financial benefits available for companies that choose to settle a case with the C CMA rather than uh, take a case through and challenge uh, findings set out in the, the statement of objections. So the bathroom fittings case, commercial catering case and some of the other cases that the CMA ran last year were ultimately settled by the companies under investigation if there are a small number of companies under investigation, and actually if the evidence is relatively clear-cut, then those are the sorts of cases which are particularly well suited to getting the 20% reduction in penalty that's potentially available for companies that choose to cooperate and settle with the CMA. And the CMA is now well used to dealing with settlement procedures. Uh, they have uh, very clear guidelines, and the case teams are used to working through those cases effectively. In terms of some of the disadvantages, obviously if it's a case where the evidence is less clear cut, so the facts are in dispute, potentially where the penalty is very significant, so the pharmaceutical cases as well as being very complex are high value cases and therefore there are potentially there much greater incentives for the companies to appeal rather than to choose to settle and reduce penalty. Um, and also cases where there are multiple uh, defendants or multiple companies under investigation, those cases can also be somewhat harder to settle and that's certainly what the European Commission for example has found with its settlement policy. Uh, there are some cases that are well suited for settlement, there are some cases where actually it's harder to, uh, to coordinate the companies that have chosen to settle on the one hand and those that have chosen to uh, contest the allegations on the other. So the efficiencies and time savings that are on offer from the CMA uh, may be less obvious in those sorts of cases. The CMA's approach to competition law compliance is to encourage companies to put in place effective compliance programs. The CMA quite early on undertook a, quite a bit of research on whether companies understood competition law, how good um, generally across different regions as well companies understood uh, the requirements of competition law or whether they had no knowledge at all and actually the results were quite quite startling. Almost 50% of companies that were surveyed either had no knowledge of competition law at all or didn't understand it well and that prompted the CMA to think quite carefully about the way in which it disseminated its messages following on from particular investigations and also generally about its approach to competition law compliance, how, how it published information but also how it encouraged competition law practitioners to undertake more of an advocacy role for companies in putting competition compliance higher up the agenda at, at board level. So we've seen a number of uh, investigations which have ended in uh, not only a press release from the CMA but also follow-up action through trade associations but also sending of advisory letters or, or warning letters to companies to increase their knowledge of, of competition law and how it applies in their sector. At the same time, we've seen a, a carrot and stick approach from, uh, from the CMA. The OFT has always had, as part of its fining guidelines, a mitigating factor for whether a company had a compliance program in place. But I think we've seen a renewed emphasis on that by the CMA. In a number of their cases, they've been prepared to offer a reduction in penalty of anywhere between 5 and 10% for companies uh, 
either which had a comp competition compliance program in place, or as part of a, for example, settlement discussions, had a firm commitment to adhere to competition law compliance and could take verifiable action and show that they had implemented that program throughout the, their staff.